remember what it's called? Anybody? Does anybody remember the, the title of the first sermon in this series? God won't give you more than you can handle, remember? The whole series is about Christian sayings that are not really true. The first one was, God won't give you more than you can handle. What was the second one? Does anybody recall? Anybody? Everything happens for a reason. But that might have been the first one, that everything happens for a reason. But anyway, this whole sermon series is debunking these um, sayings. And the third one is this. But it's in the Bible. And I really wanted to preach about this topic. I was really pretty excited to, to prepare this series of five because I was, people tend to use things out of context to hurt people or use these cliches to make people feel bad. You know, and some of these, if you tell someone who's going through grief or is having a horrible time that, well, everything happens for a re reason, that can make them feel worse. And the same with that first one. So anyway, people often use this cliche to, to defend their own opinions. They say, well, it's in the Bible. But anyway, let's see what some of these, I want to remind you about some of the things that really are in the Bible. For example, if a pastor's daughter becomes a prostitute, she must be burnt alive. If you work on the Sabbath, you must be put to death. If you disobey your parents, you also must be put to death. You're not allowed to mix meat and dairy. You can't eat pork. You can't wear clothes made of different types of fiber. You're not allowed to trim the corners of your hair or the edges of your beard. Sometimes you see Orthodox Jews who have the ringlets because they're not allowed to trim the corners of their hair. You're also not allowed to cut your beard, and that's why you'll see the Orthodox Jewish men with the big, long beards. You can't eat anything from the ocean that doesn't have both fins and scales, which means you can't have shrimp. Now, if you beat your slave with a rod, it's not a problem as long as the slave does not die before two days are up. Because the slave is your property. You're not allowed to touch the dead carcass of a pig, which means you can't play football. Because footballs are made of pig skin, you know. Now God tell, told the Israelites to completely wipe out the Amalekites by slaughtering every man, woman, and child. And then later, in order to purify the Israelite camp of those foreign influences, to kill 42,000 foreign women living among them. Now that was the Old Testament. And now let's see what the New Testament says. Men can't have long hair. Women can't have short hair. Women are not allowed to wear jewelry or anything else made of gold or anything that's flashy or attractive. In church, women are to have their heads covered. Women should never preach. Well, actually, women should never even talk in church. And slaves should submit to their masters in everything. Now that's all from the New Testament. So you see why it's really dangerous to say, well, it's in the Bible to defend your opinions. You have to be really careful because you're not going to resolve any kinds of disputes by saying, well, but the Bible says this. If you're having an argument with people and you say, well, the Bible 
says this, then be careful. That can be dangerous and it can also be misused. In fact, it's actually a sin to use this statement to judge another person. If you say, well, you're a sinner because it's right here in the Bible. Well, if you're thinking that way, please be careful. Now you have to understand that I love the Bible with all my heart, mind, and soul. I value it, I cherish it. I believe in the Bible and I take it seriously. I read it, I study it, I allow the Bible to change my life. I believe the Bible to be inerrant and infallible. I believe that the Bible has many, many things that God wants to tell us. And I believe that the Bible applies to us today. But I do not believe that we have interpreted or translated the Bible correctly. I am forever committed to understanding and interpreting and learning from this book as best I can. And I want all of you to commit to that as well. What I have a problem with is this. If a person demands that we believe something simply because it is in scripture, then I want that person to be consistent and truly follow everything that's in the Bible. I want that person to never get a haircut again and to never eat pork and to stone their children if they talk back. I don't want them to just pick and choose whatever they want from the Bible and follow whatever they think supports their opinion. But you know, saying, I really don't want people to follow everything because that really is kind of ridiculous. But people will just pull sentences from the Bible and use them to condemn and judge and make other people feel as if they're going to be going to hell just from taking these verses in isolation. And that's what we need to be careful of. If we really follow everything in the Bible, then we will be acting in some pretty terrible ways. I just want people to realize and understand that saying, but, but it's in the Bible, is dangerous. Because we are not able to interpret the true meaning, the true intent of what the scriptures are trying to teach us. We need to be in constant prayer and asking God to teach us, lead us, show us what God wants us to know from God's holy scriptures so that we can live accordingly. We've got to have the helper Jesus sent us to help us interpret and understand. But the fact remains, we as humans do not fully understand, and we as humans are not able to interpret accurately. So my, the gist of my sermon is to be very careful. You know, I've done lots of translation work and lots of research, and I find it fascinating and overwhelming to realize, no wonder we have so many denominations and so many different doctrines and so many different issues that separate us in Christendom. Because it's a fact that when you read scripture, if you're in a group of people all studying scripture, every single person is going to have a different interpretation of the same passage. It's based on your experience, on your background, on your opinions. All of those become your filter through which you interpret scripture. No one can be, can be absolutely um, neutral, that is for sure. You know, your level, your economic level, your gender, everything that has been in your experience colors how you interpret the scripture. And every time you sign the scripture, you change your interpretation, right? So if you're standing here, if you stand here and interpret, God said, let there be light, and there was light, and then you come, then that's how one person may inter interpret. Another person may say, God said, let there be light, and there was light. 
Do you see the difference in those interpretations? We bring our personalities, our opinions, our beliefs, our backgrounds, our parents' beliefs, how we were raised, whatever we heard growing up in the church, our race, everything we have, we bring to us when we translate the scriptures. And even Jesus reinterpreted scripture. Remember what Jesus said? He said, you have heard the saying, thou shalt not kill, but I come to tell you, you who have evil in your heart have already committed murder. So even Jesus reinterpreted scripture. That's why it's danger to say, well, the Bible says this, and you are going to hell, because it's right here in the book. You are a sinner. Ooh. You know, something that can be very obvious to one person is not obvious at all to, any, to another person. Because when we look at one verse, and then back away, there can be so many different interpretations of one verse. You know, and historically, there have been so many misinterpretations in the Bible, of the Bible. Now, in the mid-1800s, that argument of, but it's in the Bible, was the first time that that was really popular in this country. And it was used to protect the landowner's rights to have slaves. This was used in the decades leading up to the Civil War, and it was used to, defense, to defend the practice of slavery. Defenders pointed to more than more than 200 verses permitting slavery. Oh, there was a recent really terrific academic paper published about all the pro-slavery literature that was written prior to the Civil War. And the paper indicated that half of the pro-slavery literature was written by pastors, pastors, that's humiliating, but pastors who pointed to scriptures to show that slavery was acceptable because the Bible said so. If any of you have seen the movie 12 Years a Slave, it was just soul wrenching. It was one of the best movies to portray Well, you know, I'm, I'm Caucasian, so I can't fully understand what it was like. But there's one scene that will just make you think, oh my gosh, it'll keep you on the edge of your seat watching that. And it gives us just a small glimpse of how people have mistreated other people due to misinterpretation of God's word. Now in that movie, one of the slave owners quotes a verse from Luke. And he quotes Luke chapter 12, verse 47, if you can get that slide. And it says, he says this in the movie, one of the characters quotes this from the Bible. And it says, the servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. That was straight from the movie. And that verse was straight from the Bible. And they're not talking about racial slavery. They're talking about or getting to heaven. They're talking about all something completely different. But people use that verse to justify how they treated their slaves. And they thought that they were uh, 
would be able to say that they could be rich by doing this. They thought, I can go to Africa and I can rest, wrench people from their families. I can rest them to a new country to work on my plantation. And I can be rich. I can beat them. I can kill them. I can rape them. I can do anything I want with them because it's in the Bible. Can you imagine that? Now that was a New Testament verse, and people used that verse to routinely justify beating slaves. And when people objected to this barbaric treatment, the slaveholders would say, but it's in the Bible. And that was happening in the year 1800. It's easy to misinterpret the Bible to oppress women, the deaf community, the disabled, any minority group. You can oppress anyone you want using Bible verses. I've got kind of a funny, odd story here. This is just an example of how things can be misused. Now, in the 1880s, indoor plumbing was starting to be popular, and people were thrilled because they didn't have to use outhouses any longer. If any of you remember using outhouses, that was excruciatingly horrible, right? Amen. Well, anyway, in the 1880s, they started to um, have indoor plumbing and bring toilets into buildings. So many churches wanted to have bathrooms in their buildings. But some pastors didn't want that and say, oh, no, we're not able to do that. To do that. We cannot have toilets inside the church because of this verse from Deuteronomy, chapter 23, and it's verses 12 through 14, and it says, they're talking to the Israelites. It says, you Israelites, designate a place outside the camp where you can go to relieve yourself. As part of your equipment, have something to dig with, and when you relieve yourself, dig a hole and cover up your excrement. For the Lord your God moves about in your camp to protect you and to deliver your enemies to you. Your camp must be holy so that he will not see any among you, anything indecent, and turn away from you. Interesting, right? Well, you'll probably never hear another sermon on this passage. But this really was a serious debate in the 1880s. And preachers would say, but it's in the Bible. We have to have our toilets outside. We are not allowed to have indoor plumbing. And this argument raged and raged, and people were quite passionate about it before they finally got bathrooms in the church buildings. It's kind of, we think it's really odd, but that just shows how you can interpret the Bible and why we must be so careful about how we interpret scripture. Because scripture is never intended to hurt anyone. You can always interpret the Bible in ways that are life-giving for all people. There's a book called The Year of Living Biblically, by an author named A.J. Jacobs. And you've got to read it. It's really good. Has anybody read it? Oh, it's good. It's pretty humorous. It's, it's, it's an enjoyable one. If you need something to read, pick this. But anyway, A.J. Jacobs decides that he's going to spend a year of his life trying to follow every single commandment of the Bible as literally as possible. possible. And there's 613 commandments. And he was going to follow them for one year. Can you imagine that? An entire year following all those commandments. So, he carried around a pocket full of pebbles so that if somebody was sinning, then he could throw it at them for their transgressions. If he saw anybody sin, he had to, to throw a pebble at them. He also had to carry around a portable chair 
so that when he rode the subway, he can make sure that he was not sitting on a chair made unclean by a woman during her menstrual cycle. And that's in the Bible. So he took a folding chair around with him all the time, just in case a woman had defiled the seat. So one day when he arrived home, his wife announced, hey honey, guess what? It's my time of the month. And I sat on everything in the apartment. So you can't sit here. And her husband was just mortified. He had to sleep on the chair. He had to sit on that chair for five days. He wasn't able to sleep in the bed or on the sofa or in any of the comfortable chairs because that was in the Bible. Now, in the end, after the end of the year, A.J. Jacobs concludes that when it comes to the Bible, everyone picks and chooses. It's just a matter of choosing the right things. Now, I don't really necessarily agree with this conclusion, because I want to know how to read and interpret scripture so that I can try my very hardest to be consistent. I don't want to just use scripture to tear down people or to destroy their self-worth. There's an academic word for that. The academic word for scripture interpretation is hermeneutics. And that's the term for interpreting scripture. I think that's, that as Christians, we are going to continue to hurt a lot of people until we come to terms with how to interpret scripture. Not just saying, but it's in the Bible, because that is the wrong thing to do. We recognize that there are so many commandments and passages of scripture that we don't follow for very good reasons. And I want to emphasize that Jesus himself gave us the tools for determining how we conclude which scriptures to follow and which ones not to. Do you guys know the tools that Jesus gave us? Jesus said that everything in the law and the prophets can be summed up in the two greatest commandments. And those are to love God and love people. That those were the tools that Jesus gave us when we're interpreting scripture. If what you're about to do or say if you're planning or saying to planning to do or say something that's going to hurt your neighbor instead of being loving and honoring them with dignity don't do it If you are, let me say this again, if you're ready to say or do something that will hurt your neighbor, don't do it. Just don't do it. John says that Jesus is the Word made flesh. The Word from heaven, the Word from God. He is the definitive Word from God. And Christ's Word for us is to love God and love people. You know, we are going to spend the rest of our lives trying to figure out and trying to interpret Scripture together. And that's the joy of this book. Even with all our new developments and technologies and cultures, this book still speaks to our lives. We can have indoor bathrooms in our churches. But my advice to you is, study this book. Cherry this book. Examine this book. Share this book. Try to understand God. Try to understand how to live right. Love God. Love your neighbor. But do not use this book to hurt people. Amen? And amen. And we do know, we do know that Jesus